Welcome to Aztec Art. My name is Helen Burgos Ellis, and I will be your instructor this quarter, spring 2020. Every single class will help you to develop questions that will hone your critical thinking skills and make you more creative. The whole course consists of 18 lectures, each focused on a specific theme. Also, each lecture will analyze Aztec works of art and the arguments by some of the most influential scholars in this field. Before I talk about the structure of the course and to avoid confusion, let's address the distinction that exists between Aztec, Nahua, Mexica, and Tenochka, which is less known. As you can see, I wrote in parentheses from where the word derives. You can think of the word Aztec as referring to a political entity a nation or an empire that begins in central Mexico in the early 1300s and is thriving by the 1500s when Europeans arrive. Also, Aztec comes from the word Aztlan, a place of origin. It refers to the myths of migration, which is a central theme in Mesoamerica and a topic that we will take up in more depth in lecture three. Now, there were people living in central Mexico who identified as Nahua before the Aztec state, because Nahua refers to a person who speaks the Nahuatl language. Of course, the Nahuas lived in various communities in central Mexico, each had individual and local traditions. Nevertheless, they adhered to certain common cultural traits besides language. For example, in diet, dress, philosophy, and religion, this distinction between Aztec and Nahua as referring to political entity and cultural identity is actually not unique in Mesoamerica. Providing other contexts may help you understand this better. We could find examples all over the world, including in Africa and Asia. I'll provide an example that I think would be most familiar though. The Roman Empire. Long before the Roman Republic and later the Roman Empire, there were people who lived in the region bound by common cultural traits that were Roman. And when the Roman Empire falls, the people continue with their cultural traditions. And even if you go to Italy today, you may find that based on culture or DNA, there would be some who identify as descendants from the people from the ancient Roman Empire. Another example would be the people of Germany. The state of Germany establishes itself in 1871. But in 1870, there were people in the region speaking German and adhering to certain common cultural traits as well. So if you go there in 1870, of course you are going to find German people. And I'm taping this in March of 2020. But if the German state were to disintegrate tomorrow, people who identified as German would still be there. These are the 18 lectures that make up this course. As you can see, I, I have subdivided them into three groups. Uh, part one would be introduction and beginnings. Part two would be artistic and intellectual expressions. And part three, the Aztecs and their society. So part one, it will be lecture one would be sources of information on the Aztecs. How do we know? A very significant question because uh, people think that they know the Aztecs. Lots of things have been said about the Aztecs, and including, for example, that they would kill 30,000 people in one day. Well, I'm going to show you the evidence, uh, and I'm going to ask you to always question the, the validity of the assumptions that we have about uh, earlier people. And so this is a very important lecture, and that's how we begin the course with showing you the evidence. So how do we know? Lecture two will be on the calendar, one of my favorite topics. Um, I will teach you how the Aztecs name the days and how they observe the sun, etc. I'll try to keep it concise because I can get like really excited about this very topic. We'll also talk about a very important ceremony, which is the new fire ceremony. And we'll talk about the 18 feasts. Mesoamericans loved to party. Who doesn't? But in their case, if you've ever been to Oaxaca in Mexico, partying, they have 
a celebration every single day. I could not believe it. It, it is until I went to Oaxaca that I understood a little bit better what the sources were saying about the Aztecs. And I'm talking about the Aztecs themselves in the 1500s discussing how they celebrated and the feasts that they made. So that will be lecture two. Lecture three will be myths of origin, creation, and migration. A very important lecture. And I will make it very interesting for you because I will discuss the United States and the Chicanx people. Uh, the Chicano uh, people in the 1960s, they were not called Chicanx back in the, uh, in the 60s. Uh, today, we refer to be more gender inclusive, Chicanx. But I will talk to you about their quest for Aztlan and why the quest for Aztlan. Okay, it's going to be a really interesting lecture for you, and you're going to learn a lot about U.S. history. Uh, but but it's going to be, trust me, it's going to be very very interesting and fun. Chapter four will be, or lecture four will be on religion. Uh, I'll, I'll include a little bit about how Catholicism enters into the into the equation here. Another important uh, theme. We'll talk about pre-contact gods, including Quetzalcoatl, Tezcatlipoca, I'll give you a list uh, so that you're familiar with them. And then we also will talk, of course, about the Virgen de Guadalupe, the Virgin of Guadalupe, uh, which is um, taking on the cult of these pre-contact goddesses that existed. But we'll see how it play, how, how um, her cult is so of, of much significance in Mesoamerica, starting in 1531. Then we go into artistic and intellectual expressions. We look at architecture, urban planning, and civil engineering. Pretty impressive work. Tenochtitlan, the capital city of the Aztecs, was built basically on water. It was a little bit like Venice in Italy. And so we look at the amazing uh, engineering uh, that, that existed in this region. Then we look at materiality, which basically means what materials or what things in nature or in the world did the Aztec artists use to make exquisite works of art. Then we look at the manuscript making tradition in Mesoamerica and the scribes who made these manuscripts. Many people are shocked to find that the Aztecs or Mesoamericans had libraries full of books. And so we'll, we'll look at that tradition. And that is one of my special, my, my, the spe, my specialty is the Aztecs, but this one, I, my dissertation, in fact, was on Mesoamerican manuscripts. Then we look at clothing, costuming, and the human body. The Aztecs had a very special relationship for knowing the parts of the body. Uh, we look at uh, their attitudes towards it and how they went about adorning it. We'll take a, a close look at the role of masks in this decoration of the body and, and we'll do some pretty cool things with that. Then we look at sculpture and pottery. The Aztecs are widely known for their beautiful sculpture uh, that sometimes only people who understand sculpture can understand. But we look at, we will have a look, a very close look at the techniques, at what type of sculpture they did and why uh, people who know about sculpture think uh, that is very creative and how it has actually influenced some uh, sculptures in the West. Then lecture 10 will be devoted to a theme that in my opinion is actually overlooked in, 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 the, in classes like this, which is the role of science among the Aztecs. We'll revise issues that we look in lecture one that has to do with chemistry We'll, we'll revisit that. We'll look at, uh, we'll continue with plant domestication and how they manipulated plants, which has become a, a branch of science, actually very important now in genetics. We'll look at the role of doctors and how they heal the body and how midwives delivered babies. And we'll talk about other sages that have to do with science. Then we end that unit, so to speak, with uh, taking a closer look at literature, music, philosophy, and the performing arts. Actually, a really fun lecture, that one. I, I love that one. Then uh, we look at the Aztecs and their society, and we begin with another topic that, in my opinion, is not given 
the status that it deserves in a class like this, which is Aztec women and the role of gender. I will teach you about queens and and, and uh, maybe colonialism had a lot to do with suppressing um, talking about them. But we'll look at how Aztec women went about in their daily life and their role in courts, etc. Then we'll look at court life. We'll discuss about kings and queens in their court. And uh, in this lecture, it's actually very interesting because I will talk to you about a delegation of Aztec nobles who in 1528 actually traveled to Spain to visit King Charles V. Very rare that indigenous peoples from the Americas will, would travel outside of the continent. They would have migrations within the continent, but they prefer not to leave the Americas, what the, the landmass that we now call the Americas. And if they travel, they almost always wanted to come back. And I'll show you the, I'll discuss the literature uh, of scholars who focus on this. I was actually uh, shocked when I found this out, but that, that's how it is. But it's a very cool uh, lecture. Then lecture 14 will be on Aztec government, warfare, imperialism, and the economy. The Aztecs had market day every five days. You know, they had their own Wall Street, I guess, but they really love to go shopping. We'll also talk about uh, how the government works, how they subdivide it, and, and how um, we'll even talk about judges and courts here. And so the administration of justice. It's a pretty cool, important class, too. Then a favorite of my students, and actually the public at large will be human sacrifice accounts from the colonial period say that the Aztecs were killing about 20,000 people. In fact, I'll make you have or, or we'll watch together a documentary for the BBC on human and what they say about human sacrifice. And then I think that that will lead us into a very um, enjoyable discussion. And then we look at death and mourning in lecture 16, how the Aztec, you know, the, what their thoughts was on death and the afterlife, if they actually, if we can actually can make sense of what they may have thought. But uh, I, I will also show you how they prepare the body and their beliefs about it is and how they cremated them, how they prepare them for cremation or, yes. And then lecture 17 will be, uh, coming back to daily life, and we'll talk about the family units, the, their diet, what they cooked and what they ate, the games that they played, and a system of education, because they did have, obviously, a system of education before. And in the colonial period, uh, after the wars of conquest, one of the places in the Americas uh, during the colonial period that establishes a uh, 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 an institution of higher learning, a university, will be in Mexico. We we'll look at that. But they did have schools before the conquest, of course, before 1492 or before 1521. And then we end uh, lecture 18, will be on the conquest, the colonial period, and conserving the Aztec heritage because the Aztecs did not die in 1521. We'll teach you, we'll, we'll, we'll learn about that. If you go to Mexico City, there's plenty of people. Uh, in the United States as well, who identify as Aztec and also speak Nahuatl. Some don't, some some do. And uh, we'll, this will be a little bit of a difficult lecture in the context of uh, what we're going with coronavirus or COVID-19 right now, because we're going to have to look at the plagues or the pests that afflicted indigenous peoples in the Americas. We we'll look at smallpox, and we look at, uh, I, I, my scholarship is very focused on science, so we we'll look at uh, the virulence. So I think it will be a little bit difficult, but very, very interesting. I would also say that science will be very important in this class, and you do not have to master those concepts. I will introduce them to you so that you can begin to think about the data that I give you and the evidence more critically. For example, 
on, uh, and, and by the way, ring anxiety is not just because it is a, a backbone in my research because I use, my research is focused on the use of science to understand Aztec art or indigenous people's art. But I will show you in actually in this lecture that a, the use of science becomes very important because it makes some puzzling aspects of what we're looking at more intelligible. And it will, it, it will not be an onerous enterprise, but it will actually be a, a fruitful and, and, and hopefully very enjoyable. For example, on when we talk about family life and their diet, I'll introduce you to the concept of or, or the use of niche tamalization, which refers to the use of lime or ash, lime being a calcium hydroxide. And, uh, of, and look at the chemical composition, which is calcium, oxygen, and uh, hydrogen, right? And the two refers to the two molecules of the oxygen and hydrogen. And then ash, potassium hydroxide, is an atom of each uh, sodium, oxygen, and hydrogen. And nixtamalization, I will show you in that lecture what it entails, which is boiling a untreated maize, the one that you see on your left, this is a un- uh, dried maize. And this is maize that has been nishtamalized, if you will, that has gone through the pro- process of nishtamalization, which is the boiling in, in, um, in Spanish it's called cal, C-A-L. And I'm saying that because uh, some people who speak Spanish was like, oh, okay, I get it now. So cal would be the, the lime or the ash, the, the, um, the leftovers of, 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 of the burning uh, from the embers and, and things like that. And um, that so th- that with water and boiled, it's what causes this, uh, uh, the maize to look like this. And you have to do this process in order to make tortillas. On the, well, I'm, I'm going for the taste first, but on the health side, it, this process releases niacin, which is vitamin B, and there's the chemical composition, um, carbon, hydrogen, uh, nitrogen, and oxygen. And there's the, the number, if it does have a number, it's one, but um, the number refers to the how many atoms. And that brings me to the next point. And I'll, um, at the end of this lecture, I will come back to this, which is that is the way that it is expressed uh, this uh, chemical uh, formula, this is how we express it today in the West. That's not the only way that we could have expressed this. So we'll come back to that. And for example, when we study the very last lecture, which is on the conquest and the diseases that Europeans brought with them, we'll talk about the infectations of smallpox and other illnesses. And I will try to bring uh, mathematical models to weigh the evidence that we have. Because, for example, this illness that you see here, this is indigenous people depicting themselves, depicting, yeah, they're, they're people as very ill with smallpox. And we'll learn that the about the morbidity, which is the incidence of, of, of illness, and the mortality, the, the death rates of this, which is this disease, which is actually about 30%. And yet uh, we have reports in the scholarship of, of death rates up to 90%. So I'm going to show you the evidence so that we can see it. And by the way, an interesting fact is that inoculation, which basically means injections to counteract the effects of this virus so, so, so that you don't develop, so that humans don't develop this illness was developed in China in the 1500s and introduced a couple hundred later, a couple of hundred years later in Europe. And then we don't have really a global eradication of smallpox until about the late 20th century, about the 1980s. I like to begin by telling, explaining to my students about the five places where advanced civilizations 
develop independently. That means that in these five places, there was a ton of creativity that emerges on its own without any outside influences. And so it's quite remarkable. And those places would be in Africa, in Egypt, in modern day, modern day Iran, in Mesopotamia. A lot of people are very familiar with these two civilizations, Mesopotamia being between the Euphrates and Tigris rivers. Um, in the Indus Valley, in modern day Pakistan, we see Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro, absolutely breathtaking architecture and art. And of course, Huanghe or the Yellow River in China. And where else? Mesoamerica, absolutely our focus in this class. And the Andes, which we're not going to get to go, which is in the so-called New World. And let me show you where they are. So Egypt would be here. There's Cairo, Cairo, the capital city of Egypt, and uh, Harappa and Mohenjo Dara would be in modern day Pakistan over here. And then Yellow River, wherever is south, uh, north, Korea is right here. So it goes like around like that, right? Uh, the Chinese civilization. And here's Mesoamerica, which comprises parts, it comprises parts of Mexi modern day Mexico and Central America, particularly Guatemala, Belize, El Salvador, um, Honduras, and, the, and parts of Nicaragua. But it was quite extensive. And um, the Andes would be here, it, with uh, Peru being the primary center, but by the 1500s, when the Europeans and Africans arrive and nations and everybody, uh, when honestly globalization begins after 1492, to be honest, it, it would be in the Andes, here's Peru, but the Inca empire expands all the way here, all the way down to like the mid Chile and you know, all the way down to Ecuador and even in Colombia. Papua New Guinea is right here. This is Australia and the Bering Strait is here. Let's begin lecture one, sources of information on the Aztecs. How do we know? So the lecture, how do we know, has two primary goals. One, to situate ourselves in time, meaning chronology, and in place, geographically. I think we did a little bit of that. And also to introduce you to the variety of evidence that we have on the Aztecs so that you can see how scholars use it to construct a history and a deeper understanding of who the Aztecs were and what they did and implications from that. And I also want you to be both critical of the assumptions that we scholars make by studying, analyzing, and working with this evidence, but I also want you to appreciate the difficulties that come with this work. So let's go over the chronology. So as you can see, the very first date I have up here is 8,000 before the Common Era, which is when maize domestication occurs, a very, very pivotal moment in the development of civilizations throughout the Americas. Now, let me see if I have a map here. Yes, here's the map. It, scientists, um, hypothesize because everything in science is a working theory is that all of us human beings began in Africa and then began these huge migrations 60,000 years ago. And as unbelievable as it sounds, about 50,000 years ago, people reach um, Papua New Guinea, which is here and Australia. That's quite a long way to go. That to me is so incredible. And then um, many indigenous people say that they're native because they were never any place else and they are native to this region. They didn't migrate from any place else. Scientists hypothesize that 
the, the latest hypothesis, and there's very interesting research made on this topic, that about that, that thousands of years ago, uh, the people that we call Native Americans immigrated through the Bering Strait over here by Alaska. And the safest estimates or the most, for the estimates for which we have the most um, solid data or better data would be that these migrations happened about 15,000 years ago. And, but there is some scant evidence that it may have occurred 30 to 40,000 years ago. If you're interested in that topic, um, National Geographic has excellent uh, resources, as do the scientific journals, including science. This is the basic chronology. I try not to give you too much information. You're probably laughing now because I've given you a, a ton of information already as an introduction. But uh, instead of saying early formative, middle, late, and terminal, I just wrote the formative is here, the classic sites are here, the epic classic, and the post classic with the conquest. And then 1821 would be independence to the present. So the Mexica begin around this time in 1325 about, they established themselves in Tenochtitlan. I'll, I'll tell you all about that in, in lecture three, like I said, this is the modern period. So just, I think you are familiar with this, but I, I would like to tell you that we usually use common era, uh, zero being the birth of Christ. Um, this is a modern day, uh, Christianity is the, the biggest and most important religion in the world right now. Most people are adherents to Christianity than any other religion. So we use that because look at that. Jesus Christ was born in the year zero. And yet we call the maize domestication 10,000 years ago before, well, I'm saying to be politically correct, so to speak, is before common era. But who are we kidding? We're talking about the birth of Christ here. So that was, so I put, I highlighted in pink the civilizations before the common era, zero being uh, the birth of Christ, and then common era is all green. And I put here the establishment of the Mexica, and here we are today. So going back, um, here's where the Mexica are, and let me see, I have, yes. So here I put some civilizations for context, and I'm telling you this because a lot of students have problem me, that was me in, as an undergrad in, as a freshman, I would say to my Spanish professor, oh, I'm giving a, a presentation on the, on the Inca. And what I meant to say was the Mexica, if you can believe that. And then I knew that it wasn't called that, but I always got them confused. And sometimes a lot of students get the Olmec and the Zapotec and the Kakashla, like they don't know where, what is what. So I wanted to tell you uh, right off the bat that in the formative, we see the Olmec civilization. We're going to talk a little bit about them right now with the invention of rubber um, and, and the uh, uh, work of chemists in this civilization. Uh, the Maya continue to be there. They were in this civilization. Now, the Maya is not one civilization. They had many city-states throughout this region over here. Okay. Guatemala, Belize, I called it Belize before, but I think it's called Belize in English. And then El Salvador and, and Honduras, you see uh, uh, Maya civilizations, which uh, take from Olmec. And then we see Cacaxla in central Mexico. Oh, I didn't put Teotihuacan here. It didn't fit. But Teotihuacan, the famous Teotihuacan, would be very close to Mexico City. And then the Mexica, also, it, well, their capital was uh is Tenochtitlan, Mexico City, and there would be there would be also in central Mexico, and that would be the Aztec, and they are in the post classic. Alrighty. We should probably use BP for before present. So this eight thousand, which I just fixed by the way, I had an extra zero in the other slide, would become uh, would be ten thousand BP which is the same thing, but only scientists use that notation. Also, by the way, Christianity is the biggest and thus more important religion in the world, followed by Islam. Interesting, both established in the Middle East. Huh.
hopefully the chronology chart was is clear. I just wanted to make sure that you understood where the Aztecs fall in this chronology. And because in the subsequent lectures, I will be talking about some of these civilizations and their influences on the Aztec. And uh, the last thing I'll say is that uh, what I meant to say was that the pink would be the civilizations that are before the common era. The yellow would be the ones that are before common era and common era. And then the green would be all after zero, you know, the birth of Christ after um, zero, the, so common era over here. And this is once again where the Aztec fall. And ah, yeah, yeah. I put Teotihuacan here and now I put to darn it. All right, let's move on. In the last portion of this lecture, I would like to come back to the question, how do we know? I'd like to explain to you that we know about the Aztecs because we study several lines of evidence that we have for them. For example, we study Aztec artworks. The Aztecs were very creative people and they created numerous artworks in various media. For example, they made manuscripts, uh, which in their case are uh, look like screen folds. And we'll talk about this in uh, later, I think in lecture six. They had libraries full of these books and they tell us what the Aztecs thought and what they believed and how they recorded history. Then we have sculpture, architecture, Feather works, very beautiful artworks, very unique to this region. And uh, we're going to study that also in week six. We have jewelry and pr precious metals. So they had metallurgy, obviously, and masks and numerous other artworks. Next, we have ethnohistoric sources. And these refer to documents that have alphabetic text and may include chronicles, manuscripts, letters, and various other documents that have alphabetic writing in Spanish, Nahuatl, which is the lingua franca of the Aztecs, and also sometimes in Latin. And again, these, are made, these were made in the early colonial period by Aztec scribes themselves who continued recording, uh, who continued recording with images and glyphs, but also adopted alphabetic text. And also Spanish officials, including friars, conquistadors, soldiers, and government officers, they also began writing a lot of documents. And then we have science, which is actually a tool, if you will, that we have to fill in gaps that the artworks themselves and the ethnohistoric resources may not be able to tell us. And, and I think that this is best explained with examples. Take a look at this page. This is page 28 of one of the most studied, most admired pre-Columbian manuscripts from central Mexico. It's called the Codex Borgia. Even though these are pre-Columbian manuscripts, often they bear a European name. And this one, as you can see, it's really difficult to make sense of what is going on. Unless you are an Aztec looking at this imagery, that would be more intelligible to you, particularly if you have been trained to decipher and analyze this document, right? But, and, and look at what Motolinia, he's widely known as Motolinia. His name is Toribio de Benavente. He was a Spanish friar in one, and look at the date, 1523. He was one of the first friars to come to Mexico, uh, then known as New Spain, immediately after 50, 1521. It, they renamed it New Spain. He came to convert as many people as he could. When we talk about religion, I'll talk a little bit about what was going on in Europe and why this desire to convert as many people as possible. So he's, he writes in 1523, these books, which I just explained are screen folds, were written in symbols and pictures. This was their way of writing, supplying their lack of an alphabet by the use of symbols. They related in figures the achievement of victory and the conduct of wars, 
the succession of chief lords, weather conditions, and noteworthy signs in the heavens, and general epidemics, at what time and under which lord these things occurred. So therefore, they did write their history. It's just that instead of using text, the Aztecs used symbols and calendar glyphs. Now, we're not going to study the Maya in this class, but it should be noted the Maya developed a system of writing that is closer to the one that the Spaniards brought from Europe. Here's a good example of what ethnohistoric sources provide. What you're seeing is a detail from Folio 60, Folio 60 of the Codex Mendoza. And this manuscript was made by an Aztec scribe in the colonial period. In the image, you see a mother on the left who is instructing her daughter on how to undertake her duties well. We know that she's speaking because of the glyph or scroll next to her mouth, which in Aztec manuscripts signified speech. Interestingly, the scribe depicted the portion of the tortillas that the daughter can have. It says here, una tortilla y media. Una tortilla y media. That means a tortilla and a half. I'd like you to focus on this object hovering above this scene. It consists of a half globe adorned with circles, and it says, esta pintura significa la noche. That means, uh, that, that is Spanish, by the way, and it says this painting or this uh, image signifies night. Without this gloss, and a gloss is a brief explanation in, in alphabetic text, this object would be unintelligible to us. When you see an Aztec manuscript with text, alphabetic text like this, that means that it was created after the Spanish conquest. Before the Spaniards arrived, the Aztecs recorded information in manuscripts. But they did so with images, eh, images and glyphs. When the Spaniards arrived, Aztec scribes began using alphabetic text. They quickly learned Spanish and Latin. Consequently, ethnohistoric sources have information in Spanish, in Latin, sometimes in Italian, and now what will also begun to be recorded in Latin script. And by the way, R stands for recto and V stands for verso. Folio means page, recto means the front page, and verso means the back page. And going back to this page from the Codex Borgia, I just want to exemplify how this question, how do we know, and the lines of evidence that we have and the tools that we have, for example, in science, help us to decipher. And I was able, in my own research, I personally was able to make sense of this page. I studied the elements on this page. So that's the artwork itself. I also went to the ethnohistoric sources to see what they said about maize, because this page is referring Tlaloc, the god of rain, with a naked goddess below him. And over here, a central theme is actually the maize plant. And, and again, we'll have a look at that later on in the course. And then I used something that blew my mind, which is I consulted the scientific literature on the maize plant. And learning about the domestication of maize allowed me to propose interpretations about this page related to how much the Aztecs knew about plant domestication and the great achievements that their ancestors made and that the Aztecs themselves also continued. Chemistry, for example, has helped scholars find out more about the process that the Olmec in the formative, as well as other Mesoamericans, including the Aztecs, used for turning the sap of the tree, Castilla elastica, the, that's the scientific name, into rubber, one of the most useful inventions in early chemistry. Scientists have explained that Mesoamerican chemists even knew how to manipulate the process that they created to make rubber have the properties that they required, including for making balls for the ball game, for making the soles of shoes, for rituals, and for numerous other uses. In this image, you see a very small rubber ball. This one is solid and a handstone. 
which are implements for the ball game, a topic we will be studying in a subsequent lecture. This is what Motolinia, the Spanish friar, said about this invention that Spaniards encountered after the conquest. He wrote, Olin, which is a glue from a tree that grows in warm terrains and from which, when pierced, flows some white drops. And from this olin, they make balls with which the Indians play. These balls bounce more than those from Castile, and they are roughly of the same size and a bit darker. Even though the balls from this land are heavier, they run and bounce so much that they seem to have quicksilver inside. They use this all in a lot in their offerings to the demons. And here we see Aztec ball players who are part of a noble entourage visiting King Charles V in Spain in 1528. The German artist Christoph Beditz, who was one of King Charles V's court artists, depicted this image. And in his gloss, he says, In this way, the Indians play with the inflated ball. With their buttocks without raising their hands from the ground. They also have a hard leather over their buttocks to receive the impact of the ball. They also wear similar leather gloves. It, it's very important to keep in mind that we know a lot about rubber from the Aztecs because they widely used it to make rubber balls, as this image shows, but also to make shoes and for numerous other uses. This is a good example of how the Aztecs used the invention of their celebrated ancestors. Though the Aztecs, just like scientists in the modern period, continued to learn about these scientific processes so that they could continue using them. This is best expressed in what Dorothy Hosler and Michael Turkinian MIT scholars, both leading experts on the topic of rubber. During a period of 3,500 years before Goodyear's discovery, and they're talking obviously about rubber for making tires, the Olmec, Maya, Aztec, or Mexica, and other Mesoamerican peoples were employing rubber and latex in medicines and rituals for rubber balls and for sandal soles. The inhabitants of ancient Mesoamerica were chemical engineers. Over time, the technology was perfected to produce rubber with specific mechanical properties through chemical manipulation. Also, Hosler and Tarkinian, and also Sandra Burkett, have made chemical analysis of Mesoamerican rubber, therefore artworks, and they consulted ethnohistoric sources particularly the Florentine Codex, and they found out that Mesoamericans used the morning glory vine to make rubber more elastic. We're going to take all this up in week 10. Let me introduce the Florentine Codex, one of many ethnohistoric sources. In fact, Michael Coe, a leading scholar in this field, said that the archive we have for central Mexico is embarrassingly vast and what he meant is that we have so many documents. However, the Florentine Codex, which you're seeing here, is one of the most studied and cited because of its breadth. The Florentine Codex is an encyclopedia on the Aztecs. And the Spanish friar Bernardino de Sahagún spearheaded this project. So we're talking about the colonial. Sahagún received ample help from Aztec scribes and other sages. And this is important because Aztec elders understood ancient history, which is included in the Florentine Codex. In fact, as I just told you, scientists have looked at the Florentine Codex to learn more about chemistry. The Florentine Codex is composed of 12 books, each focused on one theme. For example, book one is on the gods, book six is on philosophy, Book 11, which you're seeing on the screen right now, is on the natural world. And book 12 is on the conquest. The Florentine Codex relates information in images as well as in alphabetic text, in Spanish, in Nahuatl, 
And by the way, the Florentine Codex has a little bit of text in Latin. And let's end with this image. It is a moving portrayal of the experiences of the Aztecs during the conquest starting in 1519. We see people afflicted with smallpox. Some of them just lying there like these two and other ones trying to reach out either physically or through words, because I explained this is a glyph or speech. So this person is talking. And here we see a very moving scene of a person suffering from smallpox and another one trying to bring comfort. Now, the image itself is telling us so much about this episode in the conquest when Aztecs were suffering from plagues that Europeans brought. Now let's take advantage of the fact that this image is part of the ethno-historic sources and therefore we have at our disposal text. And this will exemplify a little bit more about that question, how do we know? So the image is telling us something, but then again, what we were looking at was only this portion. And so the picture alone tells us something, but then if you read the text, it will tell us something. We are about to read from Libro Duodecimo, means book 12, which is completely devoted to the conquest. And this is a translation into English, as you can see, from the Nahuatl, not the Spanish. And let's have a look. It says, But before the Spaniards had risen against us, first there came to be prevalent a great sickness, a plague. It was in Tepelwitl. Now, Tepelwit was a festival. We'll study that next. Lecture number two will be about the festivals that they heard. So over here, it would be like saying it was in around Christmas, something like that. So it was in Tepelwit that it originated, that there spread over the people a great destruction. And then the text, I didn't write the whole thing because I, we don't have all day. It, and then the text explains how it, some people who caught the virus of, of the smallpox their their whole bodies, like almost every square inch of their body was covered in these pustules. And then the text continues. And when they bestirred themselves, that means the patients, much did they cry out. Much did they cry out. Indeed, many people died of them and many just died of hunger. There was death from hunger. There was no one to care to take care of another. There was no one to attend to another. That is really sad. And I want to continue with a couple more things uh, because I think you'll find that really interesting. And it says, And on some, each postule was placed on them only far apart. They did not cause much suffering. Neither did many die of them. So that means that there were many who survived. They caught the virus, they caught the illness, but they survived. And the text continues explaining the scarring that occurred after the, the postules were cured. And it also explained how some of the patients actually became blind from the effects of the smallpox virus. So let's continue. At this time, this plague prevailed indeed 60 days, 60 day signs when it ended, when it diminished, when it was realized, when there was reviving. The plague was already going toward Chalco, now, Chalco is another town, another city. It's a place. And many were crippled by it. However, they were not entirely crippled. It came to be prevalent in Teotleco, another city. And it went diminishing in Panquetzalitzli. And this is another festival, actually. At that time, the Mexicans, the brave warriors, were able to recover from the pestilence. So let's just gloss this paragraph, right? First of all, the, the way that it's showing is saying, indeed, 60 days. To me, this signifies that the scribe is not yet fully comfortable with this new Julian calendar. Because when we, in lecture two, the coming up, it, I'm going to explain about the calendar, and they call them day signs. It's saying 60 day signs, just to make sure that he's understood or she's understood when it ended. And then it's also saying that in 60 days, the plague ravaged the town, and then moved to Chalco, another place, right? And he's saying that, that it was prevalent in Teotleco, but then it diminished. But the interesting thing is that is how much they were observing 
the course of the disease within the towns and how it traveled from town to town. They were recording all this stuff and they were keeping track of the time as well. Right? And then another significant thing is that it's talking about with pride about their army. The Mex it's look, at that time the Mexicans, the brave warriors, were able to recover from the pestilence. So many of the warriors caught the virus, caught the smallpox, and they recovered. So this is very interesting. And we shall take this up again in in towards the end of the quarter. And to conclude this lecture, let's ponder this fact. We began with an image from an Aztec scribe telling us about their experiences with smallpox in the context of the conquest in the 1500s. And then the text, just I just read some to you and explained, they're talking about how it affected the patient and how it traveled from town to town and how they kept track of or the virulence. But the interesting thing is that the text is actually not, it, it doesn't continue talking about that. It doesn't dwell on that, but it turns rather to the war. It, it goes back to the war that the Spaniards were waging against the Aztecs. And look what it says. And in Nechtatilco, or Iliacac, here indeed was first begun. They're talking about the warfare. There, the Spaniards, quickly came to reach Nonoalco. That's another city. And then he says, the brave warriors came following after them. None of the Mexican died. Then the Spaniards turned their backs. The brave warriors waged war in boats. Oh my God. The shield boatmen shot arrows at them. Their arrows rained upon the Spaniards. They entered Nonoalco and the Marquis Thereupon, through, that means the Spaniards, toward those of Tenochtitlan. He followed along the Acachinanco road. Many times he fought, and that means the Marquis or Hernan Cortes. We'll talk about him in lecture 18, the last one. Many times he fought, and the Mexicans contended against him. So there you have it. How do we know? So. We have an image, we have text from ethnohistoric sources. So now to conclude the question, how do we know? How do we reconstruct Aztec history? First, we have pre-contact artworks that may be very difficult to decipher on their own. Not impossible, but very difficult. In the case of the Aztecs, we have this archive that, that Michael Coe described as embarrassingly rich and he's correct because we have so many resources to study the Aztecs. And so as, as I just showed you, the text in Nahuatl and in Spanish and, and later on in the course we'll see in Latin in, is, is filling in gaps. They're not only suffering from illness, but they're also defending themselves in war. And it's interesting that we accept a number of 90% devastation. But in lecture 18, I will bring mathematical models to revisit all this information in the context of science and see what we come up with. Stay tuned. Thanks for watching. I hope you liked it. And these are the works cited.